Lord, that you are in for something bigger than you. Let the glory of our Lord rise among us. Let the glory of our Lord rise among us. Day one was great. Day two was super. Here we are in day three, expectant that great things are going to happen today. And as you hope, may your hope never fail in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to pray for those, uh, the men and women that will be coming to minister today. The ones that the Lord already assigned for this time. We pray that they will minister the word with power, with boldness. That you will hear the voice of God in the sound of men. That they will have unction to function without fear. I pray that they will minister and bring a now word. A word in season. That will take us even to the next dimension in God. In the name of Jesus Christ. And I pray. Even according to 1 Corinthians 2.5. For we the listeners, just like they have said that, that my message and my preaching were not with the persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So I pray that your faith, our faith, will not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. So you will hear God even as men of God speaks. In the name of Jesus Christ. And the word that will come today will come in as a bullet. It will explode an explosion. And that you will be able to grab that which you need to grab. And it will transform some things in your life today. In the name of Jesus. It will be beginning of miracle to another level in your lives. In the name of Jesus Christ. And First Thessalonians 1.5 says something. That... People come and they receive the word with joy, even in the midst of severe suffering. I know there are some people here that are grieving. I know some people here that are struggling. I know some people here that are so anxious. And you are, if you're here for different reasons, but despite that, you are ready to grab the word with joy. Oh, I have news for you. It is in Romans 15 verse 13. It says... May the Lord of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with joy by the power of the Holy Spirit. Joy will be your portion. The power, the word of God that will be coming your way will have the ability to crush every pain, to crush every grief, to, re to release the, the, the comfort even to a place of sorrow and grief. In the name of Jesus Christ. And I come against every plan of the enemy to want to disturb the flow of the word of God. I come against every plan of the enemy that might want to disturb, to dissuade, to try to confuse and pollute the word. You see, it was in the book of Acts chapter 13 and from verse 8, there was a mention of the name Elimas. Elimas was a sorcerer. And he tried to prevent the men of God from taking the gospel to the proconsul who was invited to want to hear about the word of God. Elimas tried to prevent him. He tried to stop them. But I said to you, every relentless pursuer that is bent to make sure you do not grab the purpose of God for your life. May it be to them like it was to Elimas in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, there will be no man that will be able to stop the plan of God for your lives. In the name of today, as you come today, you will break through. You will receive a word that will add to you. You will receive a word of confirmation. You will receive a word of affirmation. You will receive a word that will bring some power into the, into the area that you need strength. It will increase strength for you in the name of Jesus Christ. Hey, I come to, to, you, to tell you today, it was the prince of Persia that tried to disturb yeah, by way of intercepting the prayer of Daniel. So every interception that wants to disturb you from breaking into your purpose is from no other place from the demon. 
So every demonic interception, may they be met with divine intervention. Hey, every demonic interception in your life, may they be met with divine intervention. Do you know this is a month of divine intervention? May the Lord arise in power and crush everything that the enemy has said to derail you, to confuse you, to distract you ah, in the name of Jesus. So I decree in the name of Jesus Christ. You know that some people set up and offer strange fire along with the sacrifice that went to the presence of the Lord. And immediately, the, a fire was released from the presence of the Lord and consumed the fire. Every plan of the enemy to frustrate your life, to set up strange, strange fire, I decree in the name of Jesus, as long as the Lord lives, the King of glory, let there be a release of fire to consume the strange fire. Some people are burning and they are still laughing. The enemy is turning the heat on you. I decree in Jesus' name. Every plan to cancel, to terminate you. Hey, let the fire from the presence of the Lord fall down now. And that is an option for them. Is that you receive Christ and repent and turn away. But if they will continue to torment your life, I decree in Jesus' name. Even as you are here today, let the grace of the Lord fall. Let the mercy of the Lord fall. Let the breakthrough come your way. And let the fire of the Lord fall down and consume every strange fire in your life, not just that. Consume those that started the, that started the fire as well. In the name of Jesus Christ, I decree in Jesus' name that testimonies will start in your life that you have this, the, the dimension to which you have never seen before. Let the praise of the Lord, let the glory of the Lord, let the power of the Lord, let it rise in the name of Jesus Christ. Ah, Father, I thank you because he has ordained for you to be here today. There is no accident in the things of God. He that has brought you that started a good work will take it to completion. He will fulfill that which he started and you will rejoice in the Lord continuously in the name of Jesus Christ. I worship God today. I thank God for what he's going to do in your life. Uh, let's appreciate him. Let's thank him. Let's worship him. Let's just take a moment to just worship him. Let's worship Yahweh. So Lord, we thank you. We worship you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And amen. And amen. I want to take this time now to introduce to the stage the gift of God in this house, the body of men and women that have dedicated themselves into the, into the ministry of songs as they come and minister and take us even to the next phase. I present to you today the great Levi's. Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. 
make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Uh, we thank God for such an amazing praise and worship. Uh, and I'm so glad uh, because today 
is the third day uh, of the word explosion 2021. Uh, I'm sure you know this is the 20th edition uh, and the Lord that has brought us this far is saying he wants to do more. What is God saying? He's saying my people it is time to possess your possession uh, and I do not care what the economic situation uh, has said until today. I am here to tell you it is time uh, to possess your possession. Uh, the Bible speaking is in Isaiah 6 verse 2. It says uh, after the second day he will revive us. Uh, how many people are here for revival? How many people are tired of the status quo? How many people want a fresh lease of life? Uh, the Lord is saying upon this mount uh, he is doing all that and more. I have no doubt uh, that the first day was explosive. Uh, the second day was phenomenal. Uh, but come on today I want you to hold on to your seatbelt. Uh, I don't want you to look left or look right. Uh, this is not where you scroll between this video and an Instagram or a Twitter or a WhatsApp. Uh, I want you to focus uh, because God is about to do uh, what no man can do for you are. Are you ready? I know I can't hear you, but I want you to say you are ready so that your neighbor, your friends, your housemates can say what is going on and they can come on the screen and watch what you're talking about. And before we go to the next order of the day, I want you to give a warm welcome to the best choir this side of heaven as they take us in celestial worship to the great and mighty God that we serve. Glory to God. See you in a bit.
As usual, the grace Levites have outperformed themselves. I'm sure that you were as blessed as I was listening to the ministration by the choir. Remember, this is day three of the Word Explosion Conference. And the antecedents of things always tells you what to expect. For as many years as we've been having the Word Explosion we all know that we have been blessed greatly by the word that is shared, by the testimonies that are shared, by the praise and the worship and the music ministration, and the testimonies that come thereafter. Because God is always faithful to his word. And when we get to the point where we have to give an offering to the Lord as it is now. It's not because of the money. It's simply because it's a way of acknowledging the covenant that we have in Christ. It's our seed and a point of contact. It's our vote of confidence in the God that we call our God. It's our way of building the kingdom. Because when you are a part of a trusted house, like the Fountain of Life Church, where you are certain without a doubt that every seed that you sow is used for the purpose of the kingdom and that there's integrity in the house, then you have no fear in obeying the word of God that says that we should bring all the offering to the house of the Lord and we should see what he will do. You and I have lived through the last 15 months or so, we have seen the big, the small, and the mighty fallen. We have watched hundreds of thousands of people across the earth in developed and undeveloped countries with abundance of resources for medical and for those that had none. And many lives have been lost despite what was available to them. But for the grace and the mercy of the Lord that is ours, who has, by his own, for his own reason, chosen to bless us, our money cannot save us. And therefore, sowing seeds in obedience to the word of God. Remember the Bible says, if you love me, you will keep my commandment. Therefore, God equates obedience to love. And in obeying God, the Bible says we should bring all the offering to the house of the Lord. And once we have done our part, we know that the covenant keeping God that will serve will do his part. And this house that we trust will use that which we have given for the purpose of the kingdom. And many lives are touched daily through all the touch points of the church, from missionaries on the fields, from our brothers and sisters that are displaced across the country, from reaching out medically, and in many, many different platforms of our outreach programs, and supporting the members of the church themselves where there's a need. So, when you think about your offering, is your point of contact with God? Is your seed of obedience to God? Is your seed of love to our brethren across the world that this church reaches out to through the offering that we give? So do that which is necessary. Pray about what to give and give a meaningful offering that you can challenge God and know without a doubt that he will hear you when you call. Our Father and our Lord, we thank you. We present before you a seed of faith, our offering in worship 
We honor you with it. We honor you with our obedience to your word. And we bring all our offering into this house, to your presence, knowing fully well that you will do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ever dream or imagine according to your power that dwells on the inside of us. And we know that as many as desire to give much more than what they're able to give today, or as many as desire to give and are unable to give anything today, we ask, oh Lord, that you will bless them. You will prosper the works of their hands, that you'll open doors of heavens over them, and you will cause them to be in a position to honor you as well with their seed in the future. Thank you, Father, as we use this as a point of contact for multiple situations in our lives that you know concerning each person. And we declare that we will all return with our testimonies because of your faithfulness to your word. We love you, Father, and we are grateful for the privilege to call you our Father. It's my pleasure to invite my pastor, our pastor, Pastor Daniel Taiwo Udukoya. Thank you. Hallelujah. I'm sure you are enjoying the conference. You know, I was walking up to the stage and I could hear the song in my spirit, man. I think somebody said, I said, Holy are you, Lord. All creations call you God Worthy is your name We worship your majesty Come on Awesome God Wonderful how great thou art, you are God, mighty are your miracles. We stand in awe of your holy name, Lord, we bow and worship. I think he deserves to be worshipped. He deserves all our praises. He's been such a wonderful God. All our lives, he's been good to us. You talk of God being faithful. We magnify his holy name. Yes, it's the third day of the Word Explosion Conference. Oh my goodness, the last two days have been something else. I'm sure somebody has a testimony. Somebody has something to shout about. And wait, wait, wait. You haven't seen anything yet. The best is always ahead. And so today we have a great, great speaker. He's a veteran. He's been at it for quite a while. When you talk about the foundations of the Pentecostal Church in Nigeria, you can mention five, ten names without mentioning his name. And he's still burning hot. He's still doing a great work. Relates many, many notable pastors of today. I mean, nurture them and release them. Some even give their lives right in his ministry. Ladies and gentlemen, I won't want to take too much of your time because we have his profile ready. I think he's a man that Nigeria is proud of and we are proud of. We're proud to have him on our platform today. Shall we have his profile? Introducing Reverend George Adigwe. Popularly known as the Walking Bible, Reverend George Adigwe is the president and founder of Rema Chapel International Churches with headquarters in Iloran, Kwara State, with many branches worldwide. With a dynamic insight into the Word of God, he is an apostle of the New Testament and has a mission to take the Word to the nations of the world, emphasizing its integrity. He is also the president of the Word of Victory Bible Training Institute and the Young Minister's Teaching School, which is the training arm of his ministry. 
A sociologist by training and a former polytechnic lecturer, Reverend Adigboe teaches the word with a practical prophetic insight and is known for his prophetic and peculiar anointing, especially at crusade grounds. His ability to memorize and quote the scriptures copiously has endeared him to many. He has a strong international apostolic travel ministry and has mentored many pastors all over the country and across the world. He is happily married to his wife and friend Olorun Toyin Modupeola and they are blessed with three children. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Reverend George Adigwe. Praise the Lord. I want to give glory and honor to God for the privilege he has given me to be able to share the word of God with you today uh, based on the invitation that was extended to me by Pastor Taiwo. Thank you very much, Pastor Taiwo, for having me be part of this year's word explosion and for allowing me to make my own presentation or my participation in this way and manner. I give glory and honor to God because at the end of the day, it's my prayer that the word of God will have a free course to the glory and honor of his name. Shall we open our Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, and I will read from verse 14 to verse 16. And the word of God says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all in the house. All that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. My message today is taken from the Sermon on the Mount. You find Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. A total of 111 verses. And my sermon is taken from there today. And the title of the message will be, Be What You Are. Be What You Are. Let us pray. And so, Heavenly Father, we come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may receive grace and find mercy in this time of need. Let your word and your spirit have a free, com free course among us. Anoint me, O God, to speak as an oracle, not an orator. Let me minister according to the ability that you give, so that you in all things, O God, will be glorified. Thank you. So that at the end of the day, the things we learn and receive and hear and see, we shall be doers and not just hearers only. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be what you are. There is a particular method in which Jesus spoke while he was amongst us. And you find this pervasive method also evident in the Paulian epistle. And this method is that he used what is called in scriptural interpretation as a symbolic principle. What the symbolic principle entails is to take something that you and I are familiar with in terms of their characteristics and in terms of their futures and compare that thing that we are familiar with since with something that is abstract concerning which God wants us to know one thing or another. Now, in the word of God, we are compared to several things. We are compared to salt. Verse 13 of Matthew 5 says, you are the salt of the earth. We are compared to sheep. Psalm 74 verse 1, Psalm 79 verse 13 calls us sheep of his pasture. Psalm 23 refers to God as our shepherd, the one who takes care of the sheep. We are also compared to soldiers. In 2 
Timothy chapter 2, from verse 1 down to 4, he said, My son, be strong in the grace that is of Christ, and the things which have heard of me, before many witnesses, commit also the faithful men who will be able to teach others. Then in verse 3, he says, And your hardness, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, he that warreth, and tagged on himself with the affairs of this world, that he may please him who has called him, as it were, to be a soldier. We are encouraged to fight. Psalm 144, verse 1 says, Blessed be the Lord God, who teacher our hands to war and our fingers to fight. First Timothy 6, 12 talks about fighting the good fight of faith. We are compared to soldiers. We are also compared to trees or branches on trees. In John 15, verse 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine, my father is the husband man. Then he goes ahead in verse 2, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, to talk about you and I as branches. Psalm 1 over verse 16 says, The tree of the Lord is full of sap. In Psalm 1, verse 3, see, we shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water that bringeth out its fruit in the season, and its leaves also shall not wither, and whatsoever we do shall prosper. In Psalm 92, verse 12 to 14, we are compared to trees. The righteous shall grow as the, uh, the tree, as a palm tree, and will flourish like the cedars in Lebanon. Then in verse 13, he said, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. In John 15, 16, alluding to the fact that God also sees us as trees, he said, you have not chosen, but I have chosen you and have ordained that you go forth and bring forth fruit. Fruit connotes what comes out of a tree. And the scripture says, by their fruit, we shall know them. We are also compared to ambassadors. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 said, Now we are ambassadors for Christ. Paul referred to himself in Ephesians 6 20 as an ambassador in bonds. We are also referred to as children. So again and again and again and again, you will see these symbolic principles in the way Jesus spoke. And the intention is from what we are familiar with. And what we know about the features or characteristics of the things that we are compared to, you and I therefore can now deduce certain things about the abstract, which got to do with the kingdom of God, that God wants us to learn or come to know more clearly about. So it's important for you to understand what is called the symbolic principle. And you find that again in operation here in Matthew chapter 5. Verse 14, wherein he says, you are the light of the world. So here is comparing us to light. Now, going forward, let me explain to you something about the symbolic principle. Whenever God compares us to something, whether it's a child, ambassador, whatever he chooses to compare us to, there are six things that you and I must have at the back of our minds. Number one, Whenever God compares us to things, number one, he wants us to have an idea about the way he sees us. First Samuel 16, 17, for the Lord does not see the way man sees it. God is saying, I see you as this. When he compares us to that thing, he compares us to ego. Psalm 103, verse 5, he satisfies my mouth with good things and renew my youth as the ego. When he compares us to something, he is saying, this is the way I see you. Number two, when he compares us to something, he's also saying, this is the way I want you to see yourself. Not just the way he sees us, but he's also saying, this is the way I want you to see yourself. Number three, when God compares us to something, he's also saying, this is what I expect from you. If we are the light, if we are ambassadors, if we are children, if we are soldiers, if we are eagles, he's saying, this is what I expect from you. Number four, whenever God compares us to something in scriptures, he's saying, this is the way I'm going to relate to you. God says, I'm going to relate to you, and I'm going to measure you, and I'm going to assess you as light, as salt, as trees who are supposed and expected to be fruitful.
So whenever God expects us, God compares us to something, number four, he's saying, this is the way I'm going to relate to you. Number five, whenever God compares us to something, God is also saying, he's also telling us, these are qualities that I want you to possess. If you're a soldier, there are certain qualities that soldiers possess. If you're a child, there are certain ch qualities that children possess. If you're a palm tree, there are certain qualities that palm trees possess. If you are anything that God compares you to, God is saying, you know the qualities of those things and the futures and the characteristics of those things. So he's saying, these are the qualities I want you to possess. And then number six, whenever God compares us to anything at all, God is saying, this is how I expect you to function. This is the kind of way I expect you to function. Look at what it says in verse 14. You are the light of the world. And then in verse 16, it says, let your light so shine. Let your light so shine. This is the way I expect you to function. If we are light, then light is shining. Let me be a light to the nations. This little light of mine, I want it to shine. So those are six things that we need to have at the back of our minds. Now, today we are looking at that word light. Now, what is it? And how does light function? One way in which you can describe and define light is that light is impactful. Light always have impact. And that is what verse 16 is talking about. Let your light so shine. A light is not measured by its size. A light is not measured in terms of the way it is, it's the place where it is located. A light is not measured in terms of how long it's been there. A light is measured by its impact. So the message of today is saying, among other things, if you see yourself as light, because that's the way he sees you, you and I, therefore, are expected, required, and commanded to have impact. To have impact. What does it mean to have an impact? It means to make one's contribution towards something that you are expected to impact. What does it mean to have an impact? It means to enrich. It means by your presence and your activity as light, we are to enrich. We are to add value to wherever we find ourselves or whatever God expects us to impact. God wants me to impact you. It means God wants me to make my contribution towards your becoming everything he wants you to be. He wants me to enrich your life by reason of our relationship or by reason of our fellowship. What does it mean to have an impact? It also means to have an effect on light, have effect on wherever it is put on. What does the word impact mean? It means to affect. Light always affects activities. If there's no light, there are certain activities you can do but when light comes, it does not have only an effect, but it also affects. What does the word impact mean? It also means to have an impression on. To have an impression. Have you ever met someone and you really never forgot about the person? That person had an effect on you and must have made an impression on you. What does it mean also for us to have impact it means to influence to influence in other words by our presence and our participation results become different that is what light does it influences what does the word impact also means it means to cause a stare to cause a stare when you put salt into food it causes a stare when you put on light, it brings life. What does it mean to have an impact? I like this one more than any of the ones I've said, and that is to make a difference. M-A-D. That is to be mad. I remember some years ago, 1998, I was speaking to some fellowship of overseas Christians of Nigerian origin, 
And I said to them, today my message to you will be, are you mad? And they looked at me. They thought I was rude. They thought I was not speaking in the way they expected me to speak. But when I made it clear that mad, M-A-D, simply means make a difference. At the end of the message, I asked them, are you mad? They said, yes, we are mad. And we actually want to be madder if there is anything like that. God says, through Christ, you are the light of the world. This was a first public appearance. And he was saying some fundamental things. Along the line in this teaching that he gave, the Mount, I mean, the, the Sermon on the Mount, which has been acclaimed as the best sermon ever preached, you will hear him say, you have heard it has been said, but now I say. So he was looking at these people and saying, you are. You may not look like it. You may not smell like it. You may not appear like it. You may not even believe it. You are saying to them, but you are the light of the world. Now I'm speaking to you right now. You, that is you, 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 not someone else. You are the light of the world. The world is your constituency. One of the things that God have helped me come to realize was that after I got born again in 1980, and I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. In 1981, December 19, 1981, I had a voice say to me in the English language, I have called thee, I have chosen thee, I have ordained and anointed thee to take my word to the nations, emphasizing its integrity in 1981. Eventually, by the grace of God, from 1989, I have traveled to all the six habitable continents of the world, to over 126 countries and territories. And I've come to accept indeed that I'm the light of the world. But when God said it that day, it looked so far-fetched. It looked so impossible. But I was stupid enough to believe it. I went about telling everyone who cared that God had given me a call to take his word to the nations. There were skeptics that have doubted, that doubted when I shared this with them. But today, they have made a believer out of them that indeed the world is the constituency of every child of God. When God sent his son into this world, the world was his constituency. Behold the lamp of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Whether he's been able to do that for every one of the 7 billion people on the face of the earth is something different. But he believed it and he came. Whether I've been able to touch all the nations God intended for me to touch, it's a different thing. But 126 countries and still counting is the expression of what I've been able to do as light. So I'm challenging you today. Be what you are. God expects you to function in terms of having impact. God expects you. You have expectations from God. But I'm saying this to you today, that one of God's expectation and delight and desire is that you use your life for making impact. You are the light of the world. One translation that I like says, you are the light of the okay, you are the light of the world. Then one other one says, You are the light for the whole world. Another one says, You are light of Christ to the world. That is amplified translation. Another one says, You are like light to the whole world. The good news translation. I love this other translation that says, You should be light for other people. Another one says, You are the light that gives light to the world you are the light that gives light to the world i like the message translation it says you are here to be light bringing out the god color in the world you are here to be light when light comes it brings out the color i will be referring to that as i speak but one last question says you be the light of the world, the Wycliffe translation. You be the light. And that is what I'm saying today. Be what you are. God expects us, require, 
command that you and I, as it were, be the light. So, this is something we need to look at. So, in the next few minutes, I want to look at several reasons why you should be the light, or several reasons why you need to go out there and make impact. And then I'm going to deal with seven areas where God expects you to make impact. Then I'm going to conclude very briefly with the tools God expects you to use in making impact. But be what you are. You are the light. And the way God expects you to function is for you to shine. Not just shine in your own corner. Not just shine in your own way. But as the light that you are, that have received light from God, he expects you to shine. Why should I make impact? Why should I make impact? Number one, you and I should make impact because that is the main reason for which you have been impacted and for which you have been impacted. In other words, God is saying, the investments into your life, which is the impact that have been made on your life, as you have been members of Fountain of Life Church, as you have been members of the body of Christ, the investment, the impact that have been made on you over the years, the intended reason is that you may use it as it were to also make impact. When the apostles were here for three, I mean, when Jesus was here, he had apostles. And for three and a half years, he impacted them. And the reason why they have to make impact is because that was the reason why he impacted them. And that was the reason why he was impacting them. He gave them opportunities to develop their skills, not just to know, know that they were expected and required to make impact, but he gave them opportunity to go out and even make impact while he was here. So why should I make impact? Because that's the main reason for which you have been impacted and you have been impacted. Apostle Paul said like this in 1 Corinthians 11, 23. He said, I have received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you. So the things you are receiving, the things you are learning, the things you are hearing, the things you are seeing, it is God's intention that you use it to make impact. The apostles in our chapter 4 said to the Sanhedrin, whether it be right in the sight of God for us to listen to you or to him, George, verse 20. But we cannot but speak concerning the things that we have seen and the things that we have heard. They were saying, look, we have been impacted. And because we have been impacted, we have a duty and we owe it a debt to go out there and impact the places and the people around us. Number two reason why you and I need to impact and shine as light is that we need to do it as examples, I mean, as followers rather, of Jesus' example. A true follower of Jesus is expected and required to stand for the same thing that Jesus stood for. When Jesus came to this world, he came to make permanent impact. His impact is so serious that in three and a half years, he did what philosophers and those intelligent people for him were not able to do. In ancient Greek, in ancient Greece, there were outstanding philosophers. Plato philosophized for 50 years. Aristotle, I mean, he, he philosophized, he taught for 40 years. Socrates taught for 40 years. Combining these three, they taught for 130 years. But the teachings of Jesus Christ in three and a half years created a greater revolution in the society of the then known world than the combined effort of the three of the best minds that preceded his coming. God wants us to make impact. Why? As true followers. Jesus' impact was great. The people came from every quarter. When he was around, people came from every quarter. Mark 1, 25 said they came unto him from every quarter. And the people that he left the assignment to, to continue from the place where he stopped, people came the same way. Acts chapter 8, verse 8, say there was great joy in Samaria 
Acts 13, 44. He said the whole city came together to hear the word. So we need to have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ was not just to come, but to leave a legacy of impact behind. That must be what you and I desire, long for, work for, and be committed to. Philippians 2, 5, let's say, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, 16 says, who have seen the mind of God to be his counselor? Say, we have the mind of Christ. Romans 8, 9 says, whosoever does not have the spirit of Christ, as it were, is none of his. As he has done, so are we expected to. So the second reason why you and I need to make impact is that we need to make impact, not just because we have been impacted and uh, owe it a duty to impact others at the place where we find ourselves, but we also need to impact as true followers of Jesus Christ. If you have the spirit of Christ, you will stand for what he stood for. In John 17, 18, he said, As my father have sent me, even so send I you into the world. The third reason why you and I should make impact is that that is one way in which we are going to be remembered. The impact we make becomes the legacy of our presence in this world. People who have been in this world that have made impact, whether it's politics or business or in career or in religion, have been thoroughly remembered. You and I don't find it difficult to remember those who have impacted our lives. You know, the month of February in the United States is Black History Month. And whenever that month comes, um, what they celebrate are black people who have been inventors. And I have a few of them here. There is a man known as um, Louis Latiman. He invented the long-lasting light bulb. There was a man known as Nobat Reliox. He invented the sugar refining machine. If you eat sugar today, the one who invented it. Um, there was a man known as Frederick Jones. He invented the re refrigerator system, and it was improved upon by another black man, uh, McKinney, while John Standard invented the refrigerator itself. I mean, there were other people like Garrett Morgan, who invented the traffic lights. You know, when you see those three signals, red, uh, blue, I mean, red, amber, and green, they were invented by a black man. Garrett Morgan. He also invented the gas mask. There are so many, so many of them. A man known as Alexander Miles, M-I-L-E-S, he invented the elevator. So whenever you enter an elevator in a building from the first floor to the seventh floor, that is one of the inventions of a black man. A man known as Richard Spikes, a black man, invented the automatic gear shift. You know, many of us are familiar with a stick where you move it to gear one, gear two, gear three, gear four, gear five, and reverse. But it was a black man, Richard Spikes, who invented the automatic gear shift, whereby once you put it in drive, it begins to change itself. Garrett Morgan, I saw you a black man invented the traffic signal. I mean, uh, like, uh, Albert R. Robinson, a black man, invented the electric trolley. Uh, there's a means of transport that looks like train, but also works on a third road with a little bit of some iron rails. It was a black man who invented it. Charles Brooks, a black man invented the street sweeper. William Porris, a black man invented the fountain pen. Joseph Smith invented the lawn sprinkler. So many, many inventions by black people. Louis Latiman also invented the electric lamp. Now we can remember all these people today. Why? Because of their various inventions. So it's important for us to realize you and I need to make impact because it helps people to remember us. Number four reason why you need to make impact is because it is time to do so. Today is the day of the wise man. Tomorrow is the day of the fool. The wise man sees what he needs to do today and does it. But the foolish one pro uh, postpone it or procrastinate till tomorrow, till tomorrow. Today is the day. It's time. It's time for you to make impact. Now is the acceptable time. Isaiah 49, 8 
Psalm 69, 30 says, now is the acceptable time. So it is time for you to make impact. If not now, when? Start small. Think big. That is why you need to make impact. Number five, you are the light of the world. Why should I make impact? You need to make impact because that is the reason why you are made the way you are made. Now, you are made different from other people. You are made different to make a difference. The reason why God made me the way he made me is because of the kind of impact he expects me to make. The reason why he made Pastor Taiwo the way he made Pastor Taiwo is because of the impact God expects him to make. Every one of us have a shape. When I say shape, please don't only think about the physical shape. S-H-A-P-E-S. -E Let me tell you what it is. It's an acronym. S simply means spiritual gifts. We all have our spiritual gifts. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. Then H, heart, what we have passion for. What we have passion for. For example, the King of England, when he was interviewing William Booth, he said, what is it that drives your life? What is it that is driving you? And William Booth says, Sir, with all due respect, some people's passion are for gold. Some people's passion are for silver. Some people's passion are for other things. He said, but my own passion is for souls. Souls, souls. So our hearts are different in terms of what we have passion for. A, ability. There are certain abilities that have been given to us. Not just spiritual gifts, but also ability. I used to know a guy. He can repair anything. And he can unlock any door. With ease. He never went somewhere to learn it. But he could repair anything you give him. He would put it right. And he unlock the door. That's an ability. It's part of the things that God gives to people. For whatever reason he wants them to use it. For the purpose of impartation. Then P. Your personality. God gave us our various personalities. No personality is the best personality. Every personality has its own use. And then e, our various experiences in life. You and I go through experiences in life. And experience, like they say, is the best teacher. And the experiences you and I go through make us, why God made you, different because he wants you to make a difference. And even this is very easy and observable in terms of cutlery. You know the cutlery, the principal cutleries that we have? Our spoon, our fork, and our shape. I mean, our spoon, our fork, and our knives. They are all shaped differently. Why? Because of the impact they ought to make. One, one, the spoon should make a scooping impact. The fork picks. The knife cuts. So they were made different to make a difference. Number six, be what you are. Why do I need to make impact? You need to make impact because people... Things, the world, and organizations are made better by our impact on it. People have potentials. Things have potentials. Organizations have potentials. And through our impact on organizations and people and things, we bring to the fore, we bring out the potential in real terms that eventually makes them better. I was born with certain natural abilities. When I got born again, God gave me some spiritual gifts. And God put me around role models and mentors. And people who impacted me in such a way that today if you see any excellence, if you see any performance, if you see anything oozing out of my life, it's because some people impacted my life. I was impacted a lot by Kenneth E. Hagin. We drew close, we learned under him. We did not just hear him, but we also watched him live his life. He became an epistle that was known and read by me. And just like I have also been able to impact others and I have brought out the best in them. So, so many people who probably people have relegated to the background and never believed they could become anything have become somebody. I used to preach a message titled, How God Makes Some Bodies out of nobodies. Nobody is a nobody if you can have someone impact them. If you can have someone pick them up, like I'll be sharing with you today, and change and turn them around for the better. You need to make impact because people, things, 
the world, an organization, are better by the impact that people have been known to make on them. The seventh reason why you need to make impact is because it's rewarding. It is rewarding, it's beneficial, it's profitable. I mean, people always ask me, sir, where do you get all these invitations from, from all over the world? And I always say, it is a return on investment. They are from sons and daughters that God used me to raise over the years. Sons and daughters that have impacted, who have therefore become better and now answering to the call of God, and who now always remember to invite me back for more impartation and to register their most profound and sincere appreciation for the impact I've had in their lives. So you need to make impact because it is rewarding, it's beneficial, it's profitable. Even when you are no longer around, there are people who remember you for the impact you made on them. Hebrews 6 says that God is not unrighteous to forget our labors of love. When you impact people, there is a reward. The Bible said in Psalm 58 verse 11, it says God rewarded the righteous. To him that sweat righteousness, Proverbs 11, 18, shall be a sure reward. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding the work of the Lord, knowing this, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So you and I need to be what we are. You are the light. And one thing light does is that light is expected and required to shine. Let your light so shine. Let your light so shine. Be what you are. You are the light. So shine. Psalm 36 verse 9 said, For with thee, O Lord, is the fountain of life, and in thy light shall we see light. Now, you and I have imbibed light from him. And all we are now expected to do is to shine the light. You and I have imbibed energy and he's now asking us to express it. So, be the light. Let your light so shine. One transition says, let your good deeds shine out for all to see. We are not shining our good deeds for people to see basically, but there is no way the light shines that people will not see it. The light shines in darkness. The darkness cannot shut it down. Another translation says, let your light be shining before men. We are not shining the light for men to see, but there is no way you shine your light that men will not see it. Another one says, he said you should be light for other people. Your light must shine before people. In such a way that your good deeds and moral excellence will become very visible. So, be the light. So, be what you are. Because you cannot do much does not mean you cannot do the bit you can. John Wesley said something. I have to write it down here. It's, he said, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the way you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Let your light so shine. Quickly, when it comes to the areas, we are going to expect us to register our impact. I will run through them very quickly, bringing them to the fore for you to understand and comprehend areas where God wants you to be the light, be what you are. Number one, God wants you to shine in your family. First Timothy 5, 4 says we should learn to show piety by home. God told the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 to 7, that they should teach their children so that they can follow their ways. So important. You will see that Jacob in Genesis 35, verse 2, shown in his own family. You will see that Abraham was someone that God understood to shine in his family. God said in Genesis 18, verse 17 to 19, he said, I know Abraham, that he will command his household after him to walk in my status and obey my commandments. So the first place where God wanted to show piety, at home. That was the place where Timothy picked it up from. He was impacted at home. The grandmother of Timothy was a woman known as Lois, L-O-I-S. 
the mother of Timothy was Eunice. Lois impacted Eunice, who was the mother of Timothy, and Timothy's mother Eunice impacted Timothy. To such a point that 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 says, From his child, we, you have known the scriptures, which means he was taught the scriptures, which is able to make you wise unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the end. So let's start at home. The gospel of the kingdom is not just about us alone, but about our family. When Crispus in Acts 18, who was the ruler of the synagogue, was impacted, verse 8 tells us it was with his family. When Lydia, a seller of purple, was impacted in Acts 16, verse 31 and 34, you will see that it was not only her that was impacted, but also with her family. So it should be our family that we start off from. Begin small. Job chapter 8, verse 7. 7. Though your beginning was small, your latter end should greatly increase, which will impact our family. Do you know a nephew, a cousin, a niece who needs Jesus? Do you know a cousin or a nephew who you need to pour something into concerning the things you have learned, you have received, and you have had and seen? That is how to start. Let us learn to show piety at home. Number two, God wants us to impart the way things are done. Things are usually done in a particular way. We call it the good old way. But there are always better new ways of doing good old things. That is how the world has evolved. People have been known to introduce better new ways of doing good old things. And these have brought wonderful results. I remember the story of an athlete, a man known as Dick Forsbury. He was a high jumper. At the 1968 Olympics, he introduced what was called, what is now called the back flop. Before then, what people, the method people use in jumping the height is either western roll or scissors. Scissors is when you come from the side and then you go over the bar like a scissors. Or you come with your chest and then you go over the bar with your chest. When this man introduced it, people said, ah, ah what is this? But eventually that year, 1968 Olympics, he won the gold medal. Today, there is no one who has a record, either national record, African record, Commonwealth record, world record, uh, games record of whatever continent in the world who does not use the back flop in the high jump. That is the method they all use. They latched onto it because somebody introduced something new. God wants us to invent new ways of doing things. Revelation 21, 5 says, Behold, I make all things new. Let us become creative because our creator, who created us, his creator, wants us to be creative. Let us use our imagination. Let us improve on whatever has been entrusted into our hands. God wants you to impact the way things are done. The way things are currently done is not the best way it can be done if we are going to think and look at things a little bit differently. That is what Facebook has taught us when it comes to social media. Because we have learned through Facebook that there are other ways in which you and I can connect apart from the way things were in the days of Microsoft only or Windows. Number three, God wants us to impact unbelievers. You need to be able to point to someone that you have led to Christ. I read a statistic recently that was very disturbing. 80% of Christians know that they need to win souls, but 61% of the people who said they know they win to win souls have not won one single soul in the last two years. Christianity is going at the rate of 1.2%, 1, 1 while Islam is going at the rate of 1.9%. It has been said that 98% of Christians have not in the last two years won a single person to Christ. You need to impact on believers. The impact to that Jesus gave us was that he did, even while he was here. He did not just give altar calls in crusades where there were many people, but one-on-one. -on -one. John 3, he won Nicodemus. John 4, he won the woman by the well of Sychar. He later won Joseph of Arimathea. You can see how Naomi was able to win over Ruth to her faith. You can see how people impacted unbelievers. You and I need to do that.
you can see the effect that Esther had on King Ahasuerus, the effect that Daniel had on King Darius. So it's important for us to impact unbelievers. He that winneth soul is wise. Proverbs 11.30, Daniel 12.3, They that come into righteousness shall shine as a star in the firmament of their God. The brothers of Jesus and those that Jesus know, according to Luke 8.21, Luke 11.28, are those who hear his word and do it. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creatures. He that believes on his baptism shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. This sign he says shall follow them that believe. If you love him, keep his commandments. John 14, 15, he said, He that has my commandment and keepeth them, he is it that love me. This is how to prove your love. You prove your love by obeying his commandments. You cannot say you love the Lord thy God as commanded in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, Matthew 22, 37. You cannot say you love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, without winning souls. So, the third area of impact, impact on believers. When I became a lecturer in Quora State Polytechnic in 1980, I knew I was going to be a lecturer there. I was going to come in contact with workers, other workers, other lecturers, other main staff, and students too. I made up my mind I was going to impact them. And so I bought an exercise notebook. And in the 13 years I spent between 1980 and 1993, there in that school, at the end, I was able to lead to Christ 5,032 students and members of staff. I'm so happy that God put that earnestness in my heart to reach for souls. Give me soul, one man of God says, or take my soul. Another man of God says, give me souls or take my life. It's important. It's important for you and I to impact unbelievers. You must, you must be able to point to X, Y, Z and say, this one, I led him to Christ. This one, I begot him in my labor. And that is something excitingly that I look to every time when I see many of the people that led to Christ not doing well. I was giving birth to in the dispensation of the fullness of time and I've given birth to other people. Nobody wants to settle with barrenness. Barren women or barren families fight it with all they can. The same way you need to fight spiritual barrenness. Number four, God wants us to impact our local church. Your local church. Your local church, fountain of life church. Or whatever church you are a part of. God wanted to impact the church. Leave your footprint and leave your footprint and fingerprints on the sands of the time where you are in that church. Be remembered for something in the history of that church. Impact the fellowship that you belong to. Specialized fellowship, men's fellowship, women's fellowship, singles fellowship, youth fellowship, teenagers fellowship, children fellowship. God wants us to impact our local church. God wants us to impart the fellowship or the department where we find ourselves. God wanted to leave indelible impressions that cannot be erased. Today we have a very large children ministry, but I remember the 16-year-old boy who put the idea in my mind because I didn't know anything about children ministry. When I started out in ministry, I just thought church was church. And so the day we started church, he came to me and said, Dad, let us start children's church. I said, which one is children's church again? He told me, and eventually we started children's church. Today we have children ministry. We have primary school, we have secondary school, we have crash and all of that. And it's all an idea of a 16-year-old boy. But it was also because I was open to it. So not just be open to being impacted, but when you are impacted, be responsible for making sure you transmit it to others. The things you have heard of me before many witnesses, commit also to faithful men. Impact the church you are in. There is no way our history as a church can be complete without some people. Even there in the founding of Life Church, there is, no, there is no way you can write the history of that church without some people. They may no longer be there. They may no longer be in the faith. They may not even be alive. But I can tell you that what they did while they were there is still indelible on the sands of time. Number five, God wants us to impact believers not just unbelievers 
Moses poured himself into Joshua. Elijah poured himself into Elisha. Success without success or his failure. We need to pour ourselves into others. Paul poured himself into Timothy, into Silas. He poured himself into Philemon, who at the beginning was not anything to write about. Jesus poured himself into the apostles. These apostles were ignorant and unlearned men. But the Sahedrin took notice of what being with Jesus had done to them. Paul poured his life into Barnabas. He poured his life into Silas. We need to impact believers. As a believer couple in the same church, you may see another set of believer couples in the same church, but who don't come for midweek services. You can impact them. You can invite them over for lunch or dinner and then talk to them about what you've been gaining from what you've been doing. Be what you are. Whether we know it or not, we influence people. We have an impression with people. We enrich people. But let us do it intentionally. If you do it intentionally, it makes all the difference in the world. Whether you know it or not, people see you more than hear you. Of course, set the, there's no way you should not set the right examples. But you should also, by a deliberate effort, impact believers. Look for people you only see on Sunday, but never see a prayer meeting. I said, why do you come for prayer meeting? And if you come, you'll never be the same again. Or people who live around where you are. Impart them to come to the self-fellowship or the house group. Whatever name it is called. Impart people. Some people just come to church without serving. Impart them to begin to serve. Encourage them to serve. Tell them about the benefit of serving. And what you have gained, as it were, from serving we need to strive to impact believers number six or uh, number six yes we should also strive to be the light how by impacting where you find yourself in the secular world you find yourself in a street impact the street intentionally john calvin was a praying man in geneva for so long he prayed then this man made up his mind that he was going to make an effort that along the streets where he was, in every house, there was going to be a praying person. And you know what? He succeeded. In every family, on the streets that he was for five miles, this way, on the street that he was for five miles, this way, in every house, there was not just a Christian, but also a praying man. In part, wherever you find yourself in the secular world, your street, your area, your city, your town, and your nation. If you're a doctor, belong to the Nigerian Medical Association, contest elections. It is only by being there that you can make useful suggestions, that you can provide purposeful leadership. If you are a lawyer, Belong to the Nigerian Bar Association. If you are an engineer, belong to the Koran. Many Christians stay aloof from many of these places. And how can things be done better in those places if we who know the right thing to do with a high degree of moral excellence, uh, moral dignity and excellence, do not participate in the way things are done. We need more Christians, born again, spirit filled in politics. To contest for positions in the Senate, in the House of Assembly, in every part, in every area of the body life of our country. That is one way. The Bible says when the righteous are in government, the people are happy. Now, how can we bring the righteous into the government if the righteous stands aloof? You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. But let your light so shine. It's not just enough for me to be the light, but I need to shine. I need to be what I am. If I'm light and I'm not shining, then I'm not light. No man puts on the light and hid it under the bushel. In your place of work, shine. In circular places, shine. When I was a lecturer, everyone in my department knew I was a born-again Christian. 
at staff meetings, whether in the department or in the school as a whole, everybody knew what I stood for. Everybody know the kind of person that I am. Everybody know I will not allow anybody to be cheated. I will not allow any marks to be adjusted because you've collected something or you've done the wrong thing one way or the other. They know. Eventually, I was made the chief examination officer because I was incorruptible. Get involved. Don't stand aloof. We need to start to impact wherever we set ourselves in the circular world. Because sentence against an evil work is not speedily executed. The heart of men are setting them to do evil continually. Things go bad because those of us who need to stand for the right thing refuse to participate in the process. When I was in the university, despite the fact that I was not a Christian, I was part of the highest decision-making body in the University of Valenduz from 1975 to 1978 the student representative council now i took part there and there is no meeting that was called in the kuti hall where i was that i will not attend i will not allow those who don't know the right thing to implicate or to take decisions for me and that's one of the problems of our great country we have yielded the grounds to people who don't know as much as we are who are not as smart as we are and that is why dollar and ignorant people are in charge and they steal us blind. We need to get involved. So we need to impact where we find ourselves in the secular world. And then number seven, we need to impact our generation. I want to thank God very well for Pastor Taiwo. I met him in 1990. We lived since Nabimbo. They came as protocol officers with um, uh, Bishop... Uh, uh, Okwankwa. Bishop Okwankwa came to preach for me in the Lorry, and they came as his protocol officer. So they are part of my generation. What is the meaning of the word generation? Generation can be defined as people who we are born and living around the same time. Some people call it millennialist now, people who are born from a particular age. There is a generation in the fountain of life church now. There was a generation before now, and there will be another generation after now. So what do you do? Impact people in your generation. I have so many friends that have impacted in my generation. They are colleagues and they are friends, not just for the purpose of friendship, but because we pour into each other. We correct each other. We counsel each other. Iron, sharpen it iron. We need to impact our generation. The word of God talks about generation in Psalm 22, verse 30. A seed will serve the Lord, and it will be accounted unto God for a generation. Ecclesiastes 1, 4, see one generation cometh, and that one passes away. But the earth have remained. So it's important for you to impact people in your generation. David did in his own generation according to Acts 13, verse 36. He served God according to the will of God in his own generation. Let us impact our generation, friends, colleagues, associates. Let's become friends with people so that we can pour a bit of what we know into them. I have ministry friends that impact me and that I impact. You can't get there alone. God knows. No, we are strong alone, but we need to operate in relationships. God has put relationship there to fortify our capability. Two are better than one because they have a better reward for their labor. Be what you are. Let me tell you again this one. There are some of us who know something that some people don't know. Those who don't know something that you know are not fools. They only have areas where they know. Uh, so you impact people in the areas where you know they don't know. I don't know much, for example, about business and investments. And whenever I want to make business and investments, I have people that I consult. But when it comes to this ministry work, apostolic work, especially the nations of the earth, I think I know, I know a bit. But there are other areas where I'm a novice. And for people that I know are novices, in the area of my strength, I impact them. I speak into their leaders, I teach and train their staff, and let them set up a ministry of order because 
1 Corinthians 14, 40, he said, let all things be done decently and in order. In the next few minutes, I want to share with us tools that you and I can use to impact. Five effective tools that you and I can use to shine. Let your light so shine before men. Man is not a focus. The Bible said in Psalm 25 verse 15, my eyes are ever towards the Lord. I'm looking unto Jesus. Hebrews 12 2, the author and finisher of my faith. My focus is on him, but there is no way you can focus on him and you will not become the focus. Hallelujah. Tools that you can use in making impact. Number one, prayer. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, it says pray without ceasing. 1 Timothy 2, 8, I wish that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and disputing. Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all manner of prayer and supplication in the Spirit and what in general to without perseverance and supplication for all saints. The word of God reminds us in Revelations 5, 8 and Revelations 8, verse 3 and 8, 4, that the prayer of the saints are like incense in the no streets of God. Let my prayer come before you, Lord, like incense. And the lifting up of my hand as the evening sacrifice. So, prayer. We can change things with prayer. We can change our church with prayer. We can change that unbeliever person with prayer. We can change our family with prayer. I am from a family of 13 children. The first person that God saved in our family was a girl of nine years. And this girl prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed until each and every one of us gave our lives to Christ. Oh, James 5.16 says, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Prayer has been known to dethrone government. I followed what happened in the Philippines so many years ago. When a man known as President Marcos, uh, President Marcos of the, Fili of, of, of the Philippines, he was, he was deposed. Shortly before he was deposed, the Roman Catholic bishop came out and called for the active resistance of evil by peaceful means, including prayer. The effectual fabric man of a righteous man. Elijah was a man, not a group of men. I remember in the days of Abacha, prayer was one of the things that the church of God used like never before. With the kind of country we have now, we need prayer more than ever. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, when thou seest seek my face, my soul will answer within me thy face, O Lord, will I seek. Psalm 24, verse 6, Psalm 27, verse 8. We need to be the only that seeks the face of God. The effectual prophet prayer of a righteous man availeth much. One translation says the effectual prophet prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Another one says great power. And great power that produces wonderful results are within the reach of a righteous man. Another one says, the effectual father prayer of a righteous man has great power in its working. Another one says, the effectual father prayer of a righteous man has great power to prevail. Elijah, Elijah was a man, a man, not an angel, a man, not a principality. A man, not a vice god. A man, not any special. A man, the word used there simply is the word refer that refers to ordinary man. Was a man subject to life passions, human frailties. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Elisha, Elijah was a man. But when he prayed, he achieved much more than a man can achieve. He was able to activate the hand that rules the world. Prayer is capital that you and I give to God with which it does business around us. I have lived in the learning now since 1973. And I can tell you that the area of the learning where we are 
it's still Islamic as it used to be. But through prayer, Kuala State is now known as the state of harmony. How could it have been without some prayer efforts? That's how to impact the place. Tanke, where we are located, where our headquarters of ministry have been located from inception because God directed us there. It's one of the most peaceful places now. The Maga, the Alangwa, who is the head of all the people living in that area, is a personal friend of ours. Is close to us. But you see, we let him know that we pray. We do prayer work all over the places to establish the kingdom of God. I wish that the churches in Lagos can impact Lagos much more than what we are seeing. Why can there be light and salt and yet things are the way they are? Can things be better? In prayer, we can do so much more than we are doing. Another one says, when it is brought about, the effectual permanent prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Another one says, the effectual permanent prayer of a righteous man is powerful and it can help a lot. Listen to this, and I love this translation. It's a prayer by those who have God's approval are effective. <laughs> prayer by those who have God's approval are effective. Number two, power of impact. Be what you are. The power of example. The power of a nurse. Example of a nurse in a hospital. The power of the example of a doctor in a medical setting. The power of the example of a teacher in a school. The power of a landlord in a landlord association. The power of a family in the streets. All of these are ways. The greatest thing you can be is to be an example to others. Be an example to the believer. Be an example of the believer. First Timothy 4.12, he said, let no man let no man despise your youth, but be that an example of the believer. Jesus said, I have given you an example. As I have done, John 13, 15, even so do ye. And that is the call of the hour. The second way for you to be what you are, to shine your light, is to be an example. Number three way you can impact and you can shine your light is by speaking communication talking to people death and life are two powerful forces they are in the power of the tongue proverbs 25 11 as an apple of gold in the picture of silver so is a word that is fitly spoken there is he that speaketh like the pierces of the sword but the tongue of the wise is health you can use it to impact, to influence. Learn to talk to people. Learn to convince people. Learn to encourage people. Learn to motivate people. I'm not talking about going online and putting a one-minute motivation. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Talk to people. When the people are cast down, tell them there's a lifting. God will deliver the island of the innocent. You do it by the pureness of your hands. Let us learn to speak. Preaching the gospel is not just talking to people about Jesus, but bringing an encouragement. That was what Jesus, first of all, brought to the woman in John 4. As a Christian, don't be aloof. Talk to people. Mix. Light does not stand in a corner and leave darkness in no corner. No, it shines where the light is. That's where the darkness is. The light shines in darkness. The darkness does not comprehend it. So the third way to impact is by speaking to people. Try to speak to them. Try to speak. Open your mouth. Talk to them. Impact them. Talk to them. The word of God is quick and powerful. Sharper. Hebrews 4.12. The daily two-edged sword piercing into divine asunder of soul and spirit. It's a design of the thoughts and even the intents of the heart. Number four. The fourth way to impact is by giving. Proverbs 28, 27, He that giveth to the poor shall never lack. I told you we are in an Islamic community in the Lorraine in Tanke area. The Tanke community have been begging the state government to give them boreholes, one, two boreholes, 
but they did it. And up to now, they have not. When I heard about it, and we're celebrating, I think, the 25th year anniversary of our ministry or so. The ministry is now 34 years old. It's been there for some while now. I said, okay, let, let, let's come, come let's join the community. So we, we joined the community. We asked them to map out the whole place. And then we sank six boreholes. When we are a blessing, in whatever little way, somebody is making a, just another covert over a drainage is calling television station and is not saying it's a, it's a constituency a, a project. And I said to myself, look at this. I love it when people give. They are received that scatter it and yet increase it. They are received that withhold more than is necessary in general to poverty. The liberal soul shall be made fat and he that watereth shall himself be watered. If we all listen to the cry of the weak, of the, of the poor, the Lord will listen to our own cry the day when we cry ourselves. Our cry may not be the same cry, but be what you are. Whatever little you can do to alleviate people's suffering, whatever little you can do to help, whatever little you can do to change the way things are. I am not very happy when I see the kind of schools that many of our ministries have, but which even our own members cannot afford. There is a standard. In our secondary school, members have a rebate of 60%. I mean, they don't pay all there is to pay. No, they won't pay all there is to pay. That is the way it is. Because it was from their initial contribution that the school was put in place. So we cannot afford to make the school further and not available to the people who contribute to make it. Be what you are. We are the light. We should not make things difficult for people. How do we be the light? By giving. Number five way, and I'm just going to stop it here. How can I be the light? By association. And I'm just going to give a very small testimony. Some years ago, I had a Muslim who was my driver. A Muslim man in Lord was my driver. And he would drive me to so many places. So this Muslim man was um, having uh, a kind of wedding for one of the daughters. And he came and brought the card. What he expected me to do was to give him some money. But he never even expected me to attend. But you see, if you are going to be the light, you are going to have to go to the place where the darkness is. So the day when the marriage was going to come, in three days, I said, are you expecting me just to give you money or you expect I said, ah, if you can come, sir, who mind? Ah, hey, you don't do that to me. You don't give me that kind of opportunity as someone who loves to see souls saved. So I went. I made sure that the program was in process before I emerged. And when I emerged, he saw me from far. I mean, the, the, the preacher then was preaching. The preacher I will call Afa was, was sharing, was sharing the word in their own way, encouraging people for marital life and all of that. And so when he saw me, he told the man to please keep quiet that this is his, uh, the, his uh, employer. And he invited the employer to come and that he never knew I was going to come, but he's so grateful that I came. That apart from then he started elogizing how we've been helping him, supporting him, and all of that. And I had to tell him that that was enough. So he stopped. And so the message continued from the other man. So at the end of the Islamic man preaching, my staff, who was now the master of the day, who was the father of the day, said, ah, well, there are two pastors here. There is a pastor from my religion, but there is this other pastor here who is so important to me because he has been contributing to my welfare, and that's why I have children to show for it. He said, so I'm going to invite him to speak. So he gave me opportunity, and I spoke on the peace of God. The peace from God, the peace of God that passes on understanding. And immediately I finished preaching, I look at the man. I mean, I looked at them around. All of them were looking at me. They marveled at the thing that I had sp spoken. I didn't say, according to Ephesians, according to God. They don't understand that. I was just speaking, speaking scriptures. I seem to say I was talking naturally. Then I said, if you want this peace, and you know you don't have peace, raise up your hand. It was this Iman that first of all raised his hand. Every other person raised their hand. 
my staff was laughing. <laughs> because only God how many, knew how many times he had raised his hand. He was laughing. And so I prayed for him. I said, put your hand on your chest. I said this. Oh God, I need peace in my life. Come and touch me. Come and change me from inside. Come and help me to dedicate my life to the right thing and to do the right thing to the glory and honor of your name. And then the imam said, even after I finished, he said, even the little prayer I prayed that his blood, print, his blood pressure have gone down. <laughs> Association. By associating with people, you can impact them. Paul said, I have made all things to all men, so that by all means I may win some. To the Jews, I became a Jew. To them who are under the law, I became like somebody under the law. To them who are without the law, I became like someone without the law. I have made all things to all men, so that by all means I may win some. Pastor Taiwo, thank you very much for the privilege and the invitation you've given me to be here. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. I wish that it was a journey I can make, but uh, I've kept to time, and I know blessed are they that uh, keep to time, for they shall be invited back. I look forward to another day, another time, where we can have many more sessions, and I can share with you of the things that I have been taught. The Lord bless you. People of God, I want to pray for you. Father, thank you for everything that has been said. Let these things that have been said not be to their condemnation, but let it be for their justification. Because as they become doers of these words and not hearers only, let them begin to reap a harvest of great returns on being the light and impacting the people and the places where they find themselves. Let it all be to the glory and honor of your name. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome back, people of God. Oh, what a word in season. I just want to say a big God bless you, Reverend George Adeboe. This word is so timely. In fact, it is provocative. And why did I say it's provocative? The concept and the word of impact is what should be a reality of every Christian. And he has just put them into many, many simple ways on how we can do some impact in our generation. And just in case maybe you came in in the middle of the message or you were trying to really grapple all the things that were said, let me share with you some of the things that I got. And I know that as I say these things, they will re-echo for you a confirmation of how to make an impact in your generation. And the first thing he says on how to make an impact is to be given to a life of prayer. Oh, it is such an amazing word because from his analogy, he is explaining to us that even when he was in his town, he made prayer such a lifestyle that even the environment could feel the impact. Peace was restored in that area because they were given to prayer. The second thing is the power of being an example. Oh, this is such a good word uh, because the Bible speaks. It says, uh, do not let anybody despise you because you are a youth, but set an example for the believers in life, in love, in faith, in purity, in speech, and in the spirit. We need to be an example to our generation. We need to be things of Sinosha to our world. Uh, people need to see us and see Jesus. Be an example today. The third is speak speaking, communicating. You are not an island. God created you so that you can reach out. The Bible says, go ye now into the world and preach the good news. The good news is the gospel. Telling somebody that you are healed when they are sick is the good news. Telling somebody that hope is coming alive in them again when they feel that they are distraught and defenseless is the good news. Go out, communicate, evangelize, confess the power of life and death, as he said, is in the tongue. The third thing he said, or the fourth thing he said, is you must give to a life of giving. A life of giving, we are not just blessed to be blessed. We are blessed to be a blessing. Uh, today the Lord is saying from the mouth of his son uh, that we need to communicate not just with words uh, but with the substance of our pockets, with the substance of our skills, uh, with the substance of our hearts. Uh, we need to be people sold out to giving. Uh, and the last but not the least, uh, he says uh, that we should be an association. Uh, we should not walk as an island. We should not stay just in isolation. We should gather together. We should assemble we should talk to people. We should bring things together. And these things, uh, without fail, uh, will make you effortlessly be a sign 
and a word to your world. What a word, guys. I wish there was more time. I wanted to just reel out all the things, the nuggets I got. But guess what? If you were not here, you couldn't get it all. You can go back to our stores to get all the messages. Go to our YouTube page and every of our social media platform so that you can get the wealth of all that was discussed. Oh, family of God, as it was said, giving is an integral part of what we do in the body to become people of impact. In that same vein, I want to encourage you, if you haven't given your offering, this is a very good time now to plunge into what the Lord is doing. Now The accounts are going to be displayed on your screen and they will be as numerous as you can get them. So please, without fail, please try to give according to what the Lord has given. There's something we hold on to. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. Giving is not only the act. Giving cheerfully is what the Lord requires of you. So please do not fail to give. And I understand something that every time the word of God comes, there is power made available in that word to create a testimony. So I have no doubt uh, that strong words precede strong testimonies. Uh, is somebody here with me? I assume and I believe by God that you have testimonies. Uh, and today we want to tell you, if you have testimonies, please send your testimonies. Uh, all the platforms in which you can send it with testimonies would also be shared online. Uh, please share your testimony. Encourage your neighbor. Encourage your friend. Your testimony is a prayer point for somebody right there. So get them into the season of their testimony by sharing your testimony. Hallelujah. Oh, God. God is so good. Uh, and as we just wrap up the service today, I want you to know that you are limitless. Uh, today is not the last day. There's still a fourth day. There's still a fifth day. I want you to plunge in. Uh, gather yourself more and more because I know that the Lord is about to do something and it has started. Uh, do you believe it has started? Come on, say, I am making an impact. Uh, tell them your neighbor, I'm, I'm making an impact. Uh, tell your world, I'm making an impact. Uh, and I see you at the top. God bless you as we share the grace and fellowship. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Now for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. And so sin shall not have dominion over you. For the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, it dwells inside of you and it quickens your mortal bodies. To the glory of his holy name. See you at the top. You are a man and a woman of impact. Glory be to God. Are you ready to receive? Because I am. I can hear the sound of abundant rain.